Good afternoon. I am, I'm Stefanos Polizoides. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Notre Dame. Uh, welcome all in the room and the 45 people uh, on Zoom, uh, where one of the uh, difficult circumstances of uh, living in the age of Zoom is that uh, what used to be a full auditorium is now not a full auditorium anymore because much of the world is out there somewhere in the ether. Um, it's a great pleasure to be introducing uh, Jaromir Steiner to you today. Uh, Jaromir is a distinguished new urbanist developer who is mostly uh, engaged in uh, the design and building of uh, town centers in the, uh, at the scale of, uh, of a mixed use district. Uh, he was a pioneer in this field. He's probably one of the most important practitioners of this rare art uh, in our country and perhaps even the world. Uh, we have not heard from many developers, I'm sure, in the last three, four years in the school. And the reason is because Yaramir is, is a very unique uh, a person, as I, uh, as I wrote you this morning, my brief message, uh, in that he brings to his work uh, various distinct sensibilities. Uh, the financial sensibility, the design sensibility, the management sensibility, I think, the taking into consideration uh, the, uh, the humanity of those that he's serving and also his responsibility to practicing real estate as placemaking and placemaking with durability in mind. That means permanent placemaking for the centuries. And so in that sense, uh, not only is he uh, on our side of the agenda uh, worldwide, but he's also one of those rare people who are actually generating the projects that we should all be working on in many ways and learning from. And it's a rare and wonderful opportunity to have him here today to hear from him in person. Thank you, Armin, for coming. And uh, I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions at the end. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I've never presented here. My son went to school here and I came to football games. And uh, for the first time I'm doing this, I prepared something, I hope it's relevant. Um, uh, we are, there are so many things we can discuss about retail. So this is about understanding you know, retail, the past, the present, and the future. And you will see I will cover a broad range of subjects. Some of them are not, nothing to do with architecture or placemaking, but I hope subjects you can relate to. So, um, so, the first question is, is there a future for brick and mortar retail environments, the malls? You know, is the internet and Amazon the end of the malls? Yes, the malls are dying. I mean, some pictures here, you still have one here that is surviving. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, we are seeing that while the malls are dying, that's not the end of this, and I created that word, OPTGP, organized physical transactional and gathering places. Some of them are actually very, very successful. I mean, the left one is one of my projects. The right one is uh, in Santa Monica Promenade. So there are organized retail environments who are succeeding. So what has happened here? What's happening? So I'm going to try to present to you uh, in a way to explain to you that actually the malls were an urban accident waiting to die. And finally it's happening. And uh, so it's a full cycle. So you can see on the top left, that's I think it's a picture from yeah, Salt Lake. Then you can see the malls you know, happening traditionally. Then it's non-mixed use environments. I think that picture is from uh, uh, California. Then there's mixed use town centers. And now we are seeing you know, uh, urban environments coming back together. So, so what happened? Uh, basically, there are uh, numerous external factors between 1920 and 1950 who really caused the creation of the malls. And uh, I'm sorry, this picture I put there, I mean, it's exactly the same mall, right? When it opened in Akron, Ohio, et cetera, and then the same mall now, you know, totally dead. So what happened? And why are they dying? Um, you know, as the malls were created, we also saw the destruction of downtowns. I mean, downtown very doing extremely well, and they all died. So what happened? 
So I'm going to think about four things. Hey, maybe you know some of them, but I think it's good to remind us why malls were created. The first thing is zoning was invited, you know, the Euclidean zoning. Then FHA, the Federal Housing Administration first War Policies, the Eisenhower uh, Freeway Act, and then the Great American Streetcar Scandal I will mention to you. So Euclid, Euclidean zoning, it's not the mathematicians, obviously. We are talking about the city of Euclid in Ohio. And that was in 1920s, the first time a city in the United States passed an ordinance where it, they invented zoning. They said, we as the city have the right to tell you what you can build, where you can build it. It's either residential, offices, or industrial, and we create those zoning. What happened is, at that time, that was shocking to developers. You see, you are going to tell me what I'm going to build on my piece of land. And there was a famous lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court by Ambler Realty, one of my colleagues of the time, and then they lost. The Supreme Court said, no, a, a, a local government has the right for the benefit of all the citizens to control the use of land. And that does not violate the Fifth Amendment. As you know, the Fifth Amendment say you cannot take without compensation. And the Ambler Realty tried to argue that the restriction of use of the property was a taking of value they should be compensated for. And the court said, no, uh, you don't have that right. So uh, the, 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 I mean, the reason why that's important, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to this, is that when that happened, uh, basically, uh, there was, uh, I, I mean, when this thing passed in 1926, it was, nothing happened. There was an incredible recession in the United States. The stock market crashed 28, 29. Then 1930s, we have a continuous, it was the depression. Then there was the Second World War. So basically, nobody used the Euclidean zoning to do anything with it. I mean, it was there, but America was not building. So it kind of went to sleep. But then you will see what happened later. Later, you know, after the war, America came back. And suddenly, people start saying, wait a minute. <laughs> We need to build new cities. The, the GIs are coming back from war. They need homes. We need offices. We need factories. We need shopping centers. And we have no time to hire Olmsted or Pierre L'Enfant to redesign our cities. But we have zoning. Very simple. We divide the city in squares. And then we give it to a residential developer. And they build those huge communities you see, single-use communities residential and you know and it was uh, offered to veterans with almost no down payment so we have this big single family zoning environments that were created and uh, and and, and uh, at that time you know uh, the, the financing available for the you know for the buyers was extremely you know pro i mean you could give a few hundred dollars and you can be loaned the money to buy your house then eisenhower came up so Eisenhower, you know, in 19, I don't know, 20, 1919, he was a uh, younger uh, officer. He crossed the United States from one end to the other, like you see on the map on the left. It took three months for an American military convoy to cross the United States. He goes to war, admires the autobahns and the panzer divisions going from one side to another. And then he says, wow, I mean, if the China attacks, how are we going to cross the United States? We need freeways. So freeways, like the internet, is a military origin, actually, when it was created. So that whole network of freeways were created across the United States. But when they were created, the goal at that time was not just to go to the heart of the cities, it was to go to the loop around the cities. But then, because the federal department was, uh, uh, highway department, I mean, the federal government was paying for them, the cities felt it was very convenient to bring it all the way to downtown. So what happened is lots of inner city neighborhoods, very often African-American, were destroyed to create those connections to downtown. And it allowed for easier access to the suburbs. And the last thing that happened was the American streetcar scandal. I don't know if you know this, but in the, uh, in the, during that period, General Motors, Firestone, you know, making tires, Standard Oil, et cetera, uh, got together. And they said, we are going to buy all the transit system in the United States, all the tram systems. Because if you can get rid of them, then people will buy more cars, will use more tires, more gas. And then actually what they did, they acquired them and then progressively they closed them. Finally, there was a lawsuit about this was, you know, plotting against, et cetera. 
and then GM was fined five thousand dollars, and the treasurer was fined one dollar. But in the meantime, all the transit went away. So what happened is during that time. So if you know taking them you know one at a time, the zoning creates that explosion in suburbs. And why is that important? Because if you are living downtown and you have an old house and you want to remodel your house, you need to borrow two thousand dollars. Nobody will loan you a dime. But if you wanted to borrow $20,000 to buy a house, there was an FHA loan available for you. So basically, it was encouraging people to go to the suburbia and not basically uh, remodel the existing housing stock and let it kind of deteriorate. And then, you know, and then again, the, 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 the freeways also made the access to the suburbs much easier. And then finally, you know, this, uh, this, uh, the destruction of the, you know, street cars, you know, make it create an explosion basically toward the suburbs and people start moving out. And when they moved out, then people said, we need to give them shopping, you know, downtown too complicated. So they created in the single use environments, all these regional malls and almost uh, 1500 at the peak of the, of the market. But things were going to change. And, you know, your dean is involved in all this. The CNU was created, the Council for New Urbanism. At that time, it was very important. Today, they do lots of bickering, not important. But at that time, they were revolutionary. And basically, they were trying to, to bring back, you know, the sense of place, the importance of the, the you know, the, those environments and so forth. Then, you know, uh, other things happened. And, uh, and, and it's between the CNU, then internet, Amazon, Wayfair, buying goods, and then the fiscal policies, you know, impact income distribution. I will talk about all this. Suddenly, everything reversed, and then malls start dying again. And uh, so CNU, uh, charter in 1996, uh, uh, basically, instead of zoning, placemaking became more important. That is what faces the person and not, you know, looking from a from the sky and separating the users. They reintroduced the need for downtowns and mixed use places because during that period, over the 50 year period, America's population increased by 100 million, 200 to 300 million. And we had half, I mean, we have no new downtowns and the ones we had were destroyed. So they came back and introduced again that notion. And also the introduction of leisure time destinations, places with restaurants and places where you can gather to, to enjoy. Then uh, internet and uh, I mean, I don't need to explain to you. I mean, you, you understand, right? I mean, there was no internet. Suddenly internet comes, uh, goods start selling online. And then, you know, uh, and that starts having a, a major impact. And, uh, but it's important to understand that the internet alone is not the cause of the failure of the malls. Because there's a major misjudgment. Uh, if you want, when today 15% of sales are online, about a third of them were always online uh, because they were catalog sales and things like that. And then the, 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 the other third of them were, I mean, uh, you know, the, the platforms acting as intermediaries between us and like Amazon. And then the brick and mortar retailers do other third of the sales. So the impact of the sale losses to Amazon, et cetera, could not be the reason of the death of the malls. The main reason of the death of the malls is this. Between 90 and 2015, the purchasing power of the middle class decreased. So look at it carefully. You see the flat line at the bottom. I think I can point out you know, that line at the bottom. This is basically after the war until 1980. 1980 is when Reagan became president. During that 35 year period, basically the top 10% of the Americans Earn declared to the IRS 35% uh, of the total American income. The bottom 90% of the Americans declared the remaining 65-70%. Reagan revolution, today that ratio has changed. And today the top 10% of the Americans declared half of the total income and the bottom 90% of the Americans declared the other half of the total income. This is really important to understand. It's not very obvious. So during 35 years, between 1980 and 2015, 90% of the Americans who spent paycheck to paycheck all the money they make and you know, went to the malls and purchased things, our parents, your grandparents, and so forth, suddenly their purchasing power starts shrinking. 
It was not obvious because of inflation, it didn't appear, but they only much less money to spend. And when you move that money to the top 10% of the earners, they don't spend the money. I mean, you, when you get three times the money, you're not going to buy three times more shirts. You know, so that had a big impact on, on retail. And what is interesting, and obviously you are, most of you are too young to remember, but the older ones know, it was between 1980 and 2015 that we created the warehouse clubs, that we created the outlet centers, that we created, you know, when Gap invented Old Navy, you know, and basically it was all the discount tools, the warehouse clubs were created to basically make up for the diminution of the income of uh, uh, Americans. So what happened is in 1950, there were no malls. All these false regulations, the FHA, Eisenhower Freeway Act and all that things pushed everything to 1500 malls. Today, we have about 800 valid malls and we projected that by 2030, we'll be down to about 250 malls. Okay, so brick and mortar is dying. I mean, I said, are they dying? Isn't it dying? Doesn't look very good. But actually there's more to the story. So, so what is the future? Going uh, forward, there is going to be, uh, I mean, a change in distribution of goods and services. Uh, E-commerce clearly is going to transform. Uh, customer accessible retail spaces will continue to deliver most goods and services still. I mean, you are still going to go to the store to buy things. And the physical environments are going to become more for gathering and experiential spaces. But so, so what's going on here? The malls that we are seeing dying, which is very spectacular, we are going down to 250 malls or 1500, is only a very small portion of the brick and mortar retail universe. So if you want the, the top of the page, I show you a mall in a town center, that group of retail represent only about 15, I mean 10, okay, 12% of the total retail environment. The remaining 85% is everything you see at the bottom, what we call the power centers, the targets, the hobby lobbies, the, the, you know, and all the grocery anchored environments who are the rest of the, of the tenants. So now what I'm going to do, I want to talk to you about the different categories of retail environments, uh, because it's important to understand how retail functions so you can then project how it's going to impact design, architecture, placemaking. There's two kinds of retail environments. They are the ones who are need-based, that is things you need. And then there are the environments who are want-based, that is things you don't need. I mean, Giant Eagle is a grocery store, you know, discount grocery store, and Whole, Food, uh, Whole Foods is also a grocery store, but they're not the same. You know, it's a different way of purchasing. Uh, Super Cuts cuts your hair, Aveda cuts your hair, different prices. So what is the difference here? The difference is uh, in a need-based uh, shopping environment, the purchases are basic. The, the criteria of decisions are objective and rational. So when you go to the grocery store, how many eggs can I buy for the cheapest price? Uh, uh, the, the, every household first dollars go to need-based purchases and the, and the frequency of visit is very high. Whereas in one kind of environment, the decision is aspirational. There is no need. Uh, uh, the, the criteria for decision is subjective and aspirational. And then the dollar that are being spent is the discretionary available dollars after the basic needs are taken care of and the frequency of visit is lower. So what does that mean though? So they have, they have different trade areas. If you look at, uh, for example, even South Bend, I mean, this is, I think, Cincinnati, there are dozens of need-based shopping environments because everybody needs to buy food, everybody to buy, you know, every, everyday needs. So they, those places are very close to people and small market areas. On the other hand, the want-based shopping environments who only skim the discretionary income of the families. And, and, and so they need many more of them to bring their dollars to those environments. So they are always regionally located so you can access them easier than the other environments. Uh, Need-based environments, obviously provide value for dollar. I mean, you can see it's Best Buy, it's value. I mean, it's a uh, McDonald's, for example, but then on a want environment, Apple store is a want environment. Smith and Wolinsky sells burgers as well, but their burgers are $15 a, a burger. And so they are more experiential, aspirational versus more, you know, uh, value-based uh, retailers. Uh, Need-based retailers, because they are close to people's home, it has to be very close to your home, 
but the one-base retailers have to be regionally accessible, so very often they are close to freeways. Um, the need-based design, and I'm sorry, that's a joke I'm going to make. I apologize for my German friends here. I always say the need-based design is very functional. Like the architect has to be German. You know, the, the streets have to be clean. The lights have to be good. Parking spaces are simple, easy to maintain. One-base environments, you need Italians and French. You know, I mean, they design put flowers everywhere and things like that because it's an aspirational design. So one is a very functional, the one-base places, in and out. I get my milk and I get out. One base environments I enjoy, I spend my time. That's a very poor caricature. I apologize for that, but I have to say that. Uh, so basically, again, the difference is trade areas are local versus regional, value-driven versus lifestyle. Retailer examples, you see them, local versus regional, functional versus aspirational purchases. So uh, it's interesting for the financial model. I know it's not a real estate class, but it's interesting to know. Like what you are looking at this picture is a power center. You know, this is where you see your target, you see, you know, uh, TJ Maxx's and uh, Home Depot's and things like that. In this kind of projects, the rents are based on the cost of building the building. I mean, every penny is calculated. Leases are long term. They sign 10, 20 year leases with 10 years options. That when they go to those places, they stay a long time. Their credit is good. Uh, management of those centers is financial. You collect the rents. You pay the, the mortgage, give the money to profit. The capital expenditures are very predictable. I mean, you replace the roof every 20 years, you repair the asphalt and so forth. And these are the portfolio of some REITs, a real estate investment trust who do those things. One based environments, rents are based on the tenant sales. Nobody cares how much the building costs. If you're a jewelry store and you're going to do lots of sales, then your rents are high. If you're a bookstore, then maybe the rents are lower. Leases are shorter. People don't give them long-term leases. Credits are lower. I mean, you should know that, for example, an AutoZone has much better credit than, for example, a Victoria's Secret. You know, if you want all the want-based environments actually are lower credit in general. The experience uh, for managing those centers is more than accountants. You need to be, you are managing customer experiences and they have extensive and variable uh, capital uh, uh, expenditures. These are the portfolios of Taubman, Simon, and so forth. Um, I mean, that summarizes those, the, those two things. So now you understand that need-based shopping environments. So we are talking about how does shopping centers or shopping environments can help architecture, placemaking, and so forth. Need-based shopping environments are a part of the basic amenities or infrastructure of a community. I mean, a, you know, when you get a grocery store or even Target, I mean, you need them. If they are convenient to your house, you like them, but it does make a big difference. But want-based environments, that's discretionary spending environments, define and add value to the communities and contribute to their well-being and prosperity. They make a difference. They change the quality of life in the places where they are located. So in the what continues now, and because this is we are in the School of Architecture, so I'm going to focus mostly on the want-based environments. So so there are also transactional environments where are not physical. I mean, you understand Amazon, Wayfair, they make nothing. They just act as a platform to get the goods to you. And, uh, and, uh, and, and there are two categories. So these are the intermediaries. There's a big difference between Amazon and what we call the DNBs, digital native brands, who don't sell through Amazon. But if they come to you direct, they sell them to you. So they basically uh, coexist. And... Uh, but the customer accessible physical environments, there's also two kinds now, you understand. There's the need-based brick and mortar environments, and then there's the want-based uh, environments. And, uh, and, you know, and again, here the photographs represent, uh, you know, need-based, the middle picture is want-based. So how to create a want-based urban retail environment? So in a one-based retail, so you tell me, okay, we are interested. We want to do things that change the communities in which we live. We need to focus on these one-based environments. So the first thing is we need to, you need to set sites with regional access because when you set a one-based environment, you are dealing with the discretionary spending of all the customer of the market. Some people have little to spend. Some people have more to spend and you want them all to be able to get to you. So they have to be regional access close to freeways. I mean, these are both my projects. One is in Wisconsin, one is in Virginia. Um, the, then uh, we need to look at the feasibility of the non-retail components 
in the, independent of the non, uh, on, uh, non retail uses. So, what I want to mean by this is this there are some people say, oh, then we can put a retail place anywhere because we'll build a big office park and the office park tenants will come in, come to our retail, to our restaurants. Or someone thinks uh, we are going to have it next to a hotel. So the hotel customers are going to help or the apartments are going to help. That's a mistake. A retail environment has to function. I mean, unless it's a coffee shop, I mean, you have a coffee shop in the rural building, but, but any retail environment uh, who is not very local amenity has to basically function independent of the other things. So the apartments that come enhance it. The, the hotel enhances it, the offices enhance it, but the feasibility of the retail environment has to be done independent of the other uses. They're only enhancers. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm seeing many office developers who have never done retail in their lives and they think that, oh, if you have 2 million square foot of offices, obviously retail is going to work. No, I mean, I can, you can run the numbers and you will see why it wouldn't. Um, then you need to find so once we uh, determine that feasibility, we need to create retailers who are uh, responsive to the existential aspiration of the markets, right? So you need to have the Apple store, you need to have Victoria's Secret. You know, it's not about having, you know, uh, a pizza joint or something like that. That is their aspirational retailers and a very significant uh, component of non-retail uses, you know, theaters, uh, bars, uh, comedy clubs that is used as restaurants because you need to create that experiential environment where people come and spend their discretionary dollars and all those venues are discretionary dollar venues they are not functional food i call functional food papa john's uh, mcdonald's burger king etc i mean this is just eating to survive the environments you want to put in those environments are experiential environments basically where you know people coming to have an experience whether it's a beer after work with friends or whether your first date or you know or it's an anniversary of a marriage or it's uh, i mean it's all those food venues are places where you have an emotional physical uh, experience and then in mixed use projects i said we need, we need to correspond i mean you need to basically uh, coordinate the needs non-retail users what i mean by this is say if you put an uh, office building uh, on top of retail you still need to respect their needs. For example, an office building needs parking. Well, retail needs parking too. So how do you make sure that when the office is fully busy and all the parking space are taken, how do you go to the retailer to shop? So there are some very careful considerations. I mean, for apartments is obvious too, right? You need to have uh, apart uh, parking for the apartments when you come at home. I mean, you don't want to come Friday night in a place all the restaurants are active, all the parkings are taking, there's no place to park your car. So the non-retail users have to be carefully calibrated and how you know they are coordinated with everything else. Um, and then you need to create a urban friendly, uh, design friendly environment. Now I'm getting into things now, which is really not my territory. So I have to be careful in the School of Architecture here. So how do you do that? I mean, how do you create an urban that is a space that is, you know, pedestrian friendly? I mean, urban doesn't mean pedestrian friendly in Latin. I mean, I didn't mean that, but I mean, basically that's what you need to do. So the first thing I say uh, to, to create those places, I think for placemaking, I mean, in my experience, the negative places and their geometrics are the more important on the building architecture. I mean, I started to say this, but the volume of the space, that is the width of the space, the height versus the width of the space, what you see at the end of the perspective, how the scale of the space. I mean, it's a room, basically. Those rooms are very, very important in placemaking <laughs> considerations. And I mean, I put some, I mean, initial beginning when I started, we had long debates, a sidewalk, should it be 12 feet or 14 feet? And the three, was it two feet from the edge? And what is the passage? Too wide is not good, too narrow is not good. What is the width of the uh, lanes of the street? You know, I mean, we use 11, 11 feet and the parking is only seven feet. We like them uh, to be tight. And, you know, so, I mean, these are the kind of thing, what is the scale of the heights? And I mean, uh, Yale has a book, Great Streets of the World or something like that. It's called, it's a big black book. I mean, great cross sections and ideas about how those things work. Uh, then the second thing is, so once we have the scale, the outside rooms are created, then for me, the next important thing for us is the furnishing of the space. That's what goes into the space. What are the trees? What are the plants? I mean, if they are objects, I mean, even the, 
the park meters. I mean, the meter where you put your money for parking your car, the benches, the, the obstacles if you want on the sidewalks. I mean, the way you design the public spaces, for me, that is the second most important thing. So the scale of the space and how the space is filled. And then third, you know, then, uh, I, I'm sorry, then the spaces, in our opinion, have to be connected. I mean, I'm using this string of pearls. I mean, I'm copying Olmsted and his um, emerald necklace. I mean, well, actually, yeah, I put them in the next to the picture there from Boston. But it's the same idea. That is, you do not create, like in a mall, a central court, and it goes weaker and weaker and weaker to the edge. You create a series of high points, and you connect them to each other in the urban fabric. And then all of them are compelling on their own right. Some of them can be water features. Some of them can be interactive sculptures. Some of them can be uh, quiet gardens, uh, can be all kinds of things. And that's what we try to do. It's maybe difficult to see uh, on this wall, but you can see here, for example, that's an important public element. Then there's an important public element into here. It's an important parking element here. Then we did an art. I mean, so they are kind of a series of spaces, and you know they are within a certain distance because we have learned that in big environments like this, people shop by district. If you know, for example, Manhattan, when you go, you don't say, I'm going to walk Fifth Avenue. You say, I'm going to go to Tiffany's, then you stop around 57, or you go to Saks on the 42nd, or you go to, you know, so all those places have to have their high notes uh, to be attractive for people to come. And then uh, uh, we also believe that it's important to consider adaptive reuse. Like, I mean, I don't want to sound, I'm not as sophisticated as you are when you say those things. But ideally, for example, we always try to create our even our, our blocks to be multiples or 60 feet plus some more, because we think that one day those blocks might have to be densified. So we want a garage to be as efficiently, you know, to be able to be built on those things. When we build garages, for example, we always raise the first floor high enough so that on the ground floor can be converted to other uses which are customer friendly. I mean, so there are little things like this we do. And we and for garages, I do it almost all the time. I always design the foundations and the columns so you can add additional floors on top. The idea of converting the garages to other uses, I mean, non-garage uses, I mean, this is because, I mean, you know, the, the car usage is going to diminish over the long term. So that's a question people ask all the time. I mean, do you do as many garages or do you make convertible garages? Convertible garages are a major, major luxury. Very difficult to do because, uh, I mean, first they have to be flat. So you, your ramps have to be ex external. And then and the load is a big problem because as you know, the uh, I don't know what uh, agency does that, but now the live loads of garages statistically have been reduced to like 40 pounds a square foot. I mean, at 40 pounds a square foot, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you need to basically, uh, you need to redesign them if you want to convert them into an office or apartments in the future, or you have to make them much higher floor to floor. So we don't do that. All the intellectual is very attractive. The only thing we do is the ground floor. We make them uh, usable, you know, for uh, other things. And uh, and uh, and also we believe that the it's the I you mentioned I, I mentioned to you earlier. I, I mean, in architecture, I should say a word. I thought I had a slide on this. We, what we care about architecture, frankly, is the use of the materials on the, the space that is accessible to the, to the person. You know, we don't see the building as an object. We see more the interface between me and this wall. I mean, what is the detail of this wall or what is the... So we are always very careful on the materials we use closer to people than what is above. And even, uh, you know, Andres Duane used to say the back of the buildings, who cares? You know, I mean, they are alleys, you know, so it doesn't matter. But again, I, I don't mean that it should be ugly architecture. I mean, you'll see uh, our project with the design buildings, but to be successful, the most important is the public spaces. And then one other thing I would like to say, that's a developer comment again, is that people sometimes, uh, I mean, as I said, non-retail users tell or a, uh, an apartment does not improve retail performance much. But the reverse is absolutely spectacular and true. So an apartment project close to a mixed-use retail environment like this, an aspirational retail environment, I mean, the values are 20 to 25% higher. You can get 20 to 25% more rent. Offices, their occupancy is much stickier. People prefer those environments. Hotels, much easier to develop around projects like this. In a simple way, why? I mean, you take an apartment project, you put it on the freeway, amenity, maybe a swimming pool, maybe some workout room, maybe a common theater or something. 
you take that same apartment, you put it next to an environment like this, suddenly everything outside becomes part of the amenity of the apartment. Same for the hotel. I mean, you can take a hotel who has no services, but you put them on a street where there are five restaurants, then the hotel has five restaurants. So that's why the non-retail uses are always enhanced, uh, you know, by the presence of this kind of retail. But this kind of retail, not any retail, you know. And then, uh, uh, as I said at the bottom, do not let non-retail developers merchandise or design retail space. Uh, so I want to show you now my project, uh, a project I did to kind of show you, I mean, what does all that means, uh, at least some illustration of it. So, uh, so that's a project we opened in 1990. As you can see on the right side, Schwarzenegger is my partner actually. And so he's, uh, uh, yeah, the boxer, what's his name? Anyway, in the back, you see him. So, um, so that is the project we did uh, in Columbus, Ohio. So these are some pictures of the public spaces. So you see here, you know, a big fountain. Actually, that's the inspired by the round fountain in the Tuileries Gardens in Paris. And, and contrary to there, where you push wooden boats on the thing, we had electric boats that we let people sail on the, on the fountain. That's a detail in, you know, in a passage uh, between buildings. Uh, that's another, you know, art uh, presentation. Um, this is another square. There's a pop fountain where kids can play. Uh, this is a, 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 we call it that the yard. It's a green space. Uh, and the two structures you see can fit under each other. They're on rails. The structure in front of you can go and all the way to the back and move. And they can also have covers. But those spaces are activated. So it's not only you know, creating spaces, but also animating them. And then, I mean, this is a very early picture of the project when it opened. I mean, it was some special events. I mean, we organize yoga classes on the public spaces during the summer months. Uh, we do you know, fashion shows. Uh, we, I mean, we have organized concerts. Um, I mean, during the holidays, we have trains and things. Um, uh, we do fireworks for the lighting of the thing, uh, horse carriages uh, going around. Um, uh, I, I, and then the tenants we have, that's what the tenants, you see pins mechanical, it's a tenant, you know, it's a bowling and other group activities. Um, that's another restaurant, uh, you know, under the garage, actually, ice cream. Uh, that's, um, I mean, we have Chipotle Mexican Grill, you know, I mean, a small restaurant, outdoor seating on our restaurants all the time. Um, I mean, a, a theater, very important at the time, the future of theater is in question, but we, we did those things. And this is during COVID where we created the bubbles for people to be able to eat by themselves. Um, you know, uh, but then also destinations like Legoland, you know, which is a entertainment destination for young kids. Um, and then retailers, I mean, we, go, we have anywhere from, you know, Louis Vuitton to, you know, Express to Burberry and, um, uh, Untailor, I mean, brands that you probably know, American Eagle Outfitters for younger people, um, you know, Tory Birch. I'm just, I want to give you a sense of the North Face. I mean, so we do we have retail stores. I mean, it's not just about entertainment, Michael Kors, etc. So that was kind of my presentation. And I don't know if it was um, helpful, but I think the important ideas I want you to remember is that uh, the malls were an accident of history because of certain things happened. The mall are not a natural creation, uh, and that's why ultimately they are dying. Uh, but the problem they are facing also is really the income distribution in America. There's much less discretionary dollars available. That is, America is going to the extremes. Many poorer customers and many richer customers. So to leave it all, this world are doing extremely well, and Dollar General is opening tons of stores. The middle is the one that is shrinking right now in America. And then uh, the final thing is those retail environments can be very, very successful, very helpful in creating mixed use places that last. And the, and the future of brick and mortar now is very, very solid. The COVID period we had has been very helpful because it established that the pure digital native brands who stay purely online cannot be successful. They need support. They need support either working through strong databases like Amazon, Wayfair, et cetera, or they need that physical presence where they interact with the customer. The reason why they are coming physical is that, as you know, uh, every retailer online is to acquire customers. So they do that through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, I mean, all the 
social media to try to get to you to add to their list. Now, most of those uh, retailers, all those brands now, have realized that the cost to acquire a new customer is more than the lifetime value of the customer. That is the money they can make when they finally get you, it costs them $250. The profit you are going to give them over your lifetime transactions with them is less than that. And that's the problem they are having now. They cannot acquire customers. So suddenly the old fashioned brick and mortar looks very attractive because once you have the store, then every new customer, you know, obviously adds to the number without any marginal cost. And then obviously you combine the two and you function. So today you see, you know, uh, you know Warby Parker opening stores. Uh, I mean, all, I mean, Marine Layer. I mean, all the brands now more and more going physical uh, in, to do that. So the question is, what are the physical environments? Now, I'm again still talking about want-based shopping. Need-based shopping, very different conversation because need-based shopping is a replenishment shopping. I mean, we can call it that way as well. I mean, you don't go to Louis Vuitton buying the same bag over and over and over again. But when you go to the grocery store, you buy the milk and the eggs over and over again. Or if you buy underwear, you know exactly what you want and you just order. They are replenishment retail. In replenishment, the impact of the internet is going to be much stronger and they're going to be much more integrated. And uh, I mean, frankly, even calling those environments retail, maybe they are warehouses uh, in a way because you want to get something from them. So a very different impact between the impact of the internet and technology on the want-based retail versus the need-based retail. Uh, one sector that will be very impacted on the need-based environments, which is the grocery store. Uh, because the grocery store, uh, it, it's an environment which is actually need and want-based. So when you go to a grocery store, remember, normally you turn right because people always turn right. So this is your want-based shopping. You see, you have the fruits, you have the steaks, you have the fish, you have the wines, you have the bakery, want-based, right? I mean, you don't need them. You want to buy more of this, that you want to pick things and so forth. Then you go left in the rows and rows and rows of merchandise this is your need-based shopping. So in a grocery store, you have want and you have need. So what's happening is the want attracts you because you want to pick your steak. You want to see what fish you are getting or pick your, I don't know, your camembert, you want to touch it, etc. So you, that's want-based. But then need-based is the box of cereal. Well, the box of cereal you can order online. So what's happening is more and more people, this is still order, you know, pick up, uh, you know, or deliver home all those re replenishment goods, that is the need-based goods. And so what's happening is they are a person who goes out and picks those things for you. If you order them home, a normal person can pick about 40, 50 items an hour, but robots can pick 400 items an hour. So now the grocery store of the future is going to organize itself differently. There's going to be the want-based retail. You'll always be there. So you will arrive to the store and you are going to go to your want-based shopping. And if you placed your order ahead of time, all your need-based goods will be assembled by robots and be ready for you to pick up outside. You're not going to have to go through the aisles to pick up your uh, all that stuff. And in fact, if you do not order ahead of time, then the way you will order your need-based things will be on a problem on a touch screen. You will place your order on a touch screen, then go do your want-based shopping, get your steaks and you know and your wine. And when you come out, your online shopping will be ready there. So why is that important? It's important because the stores are going to change. Suddenly the customer interaction happens only on the want-based environment. The need-based environment can be put in a basement, can be put on the roof of the building, can be put somewhere else. And the need-based environments are very organized to be able to function with robots. So that means that the merchandise delivery, that's your cereals, will be in pallets, who will arrive in a truck, who will be emptied automatically, who will go to the shelves automatically, will be picked from the shelves, put in your basket automatically, and all this can be vertical. So the grocery store who has 80,000 square feet can only be 15,000 square foot on the ground and can be you know, three stories at something else, which is all automatically replenished. So the internet and robotization will have a much bigger impact on the, on the need-based environments than the want-based environments. Because want-based environments, you want to touch the cashmere, you want to see it is this way or that way, or the jeans, they all don't all fit the same. You know? So you need to try this versus that, et cetera. So it's going to be a bit different. So anyway, I mean, I hope that uh, gives you some idea about where things are going and uh, 
And if I can ask you questions. Question, which is really uh, not a question, but a, a, a wish to have it also about numbers, sizes of things by square foot for, for the centers, um, uh, performance financially, rather than downtowns. And one other thing, uh, the whole issue of, uh, of how many stores there are and the relation between uh, delivery and, uh, and, uh, and uh, accepting the people who come directly. To you. I mean, uh, the, I mean, the first, I, I, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, if you want, in order to create a mixed use environment, the retail component has to have a critical mass. And then the critical mass is a combination of leisure time uses. Like, for example, how do you merchandise for restaurants? Well, uh, for a restaurant, you have to have a, I mean, there are, there's high end restaurants, and, the, and then the price point goes down. And I mean, we believe there's at least three or four category of restaurants and you need at least 20, 30,000, 40,000 square feet, which is about five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 eating environments to, to create that mix. I mean, even a bar, for example, uh, although a bar sells all the drinks, an Irish bar is very different than, say, a Jimmy Buffett bar, right? In an Irish bar, I mean, you expect to get a Guinness, you, you want to see soccer on the TV. I mean, it's environments when you go to a jimmy buffett bar you're a jimmy buffett playing music you're drinking margaritas and you know it's all the wood etc so and what happens is you as an organizer of those spaces you merchandise to fit the customer because you can get a margarita actually in an irish bar if you ask they will serve it to you i mean they have tequila that's not the problem but it's not the target customer the customer is very specific specific and then there are other bars like martini bars Cosmopolitans is a different customer again. So there has to be a merchandising of the food categories. And then you have to offer different price point and different quality. I mean, even on Italian, I mean, a pizza can be served at three different levels. I mean, it can be a Sparrow pizza like at the mall, and it can be a really wood burning oven, you know, uh, an Neapolitan pizza in a restaurant. So, so that's one component. Then you have to get the leisure time destination, I mean, the entertainment destinations. I mean, in the past, it was a cinema. The cinema discussion is a very open discussion whether a cinema will have cinemas in the future. I, I, we can discuss that, uh, difficult. Uh, and then you can have theaters, I mean, active live theaters. You can have comedy clubs, uh, you can have Legolands, you can have American Girls, I mean, you can have places which are experiential. And then you have retailers. And uh, I mean, the, this entertainment component that is the, the cinemas and so forth, I mean, can take you know, 50, 70, 100,000 square feet. And then the, the, the retail component, typically you want at least 30, 40 retailers to offer the whole range of product so that everybody can find something. I mean, not only the old people, but also the young people. And, uh, and, you know, and, and then you can also replenish them on a regular basis. And so that's you know, for the size. I mean, we are talking about uh, maybe totally at least 200, 250,000 square feet you know, total you need to become a destination. Um, I don't understand the question about the delivery. What, how do you, um, how do you involve delivering um, goods to your metropolitan area? So, I mean, well, well, I mean, they are, I mean, I mean, I will show you if you want today, for example, and we are working on it, we don't have it yet. When you want something, a pair of jeans, you go to Amazon and Amazon gives you 20 pair of jeans. We are organizing so that the physical mall will have the same options. That is that when you go ahead and, uh, and uh, uh, you go online, uh, I mean, you go online, for example, you say, I want jeans. We are trying now, don't have it yet. When you say jeans, you see all the stores that sell jeans in my mall. And then we are also organizing so we can deliver it to you the same day. So in a way, the mall, is becoming an experiential environment, better decorated, you know, flowers and things and restaurants, et cetera. But we're also trying to use it as a distribution uh, pod from which we can deliver the same day the goods to you as well. So that is happening. And one company, for example, who does that very well is Target, you know, where Amazon has the huge warehouses. I don't know, there must be some in the region, you know, where everything comes from one warehouse. Every Target store is a distribution node. 70% of online sales by Target are distributed from the stores. So, so a mall can become also an inventory base. So, I mean, 
But the problem is the software running the inventories of the retailers is not standardized. So it's very difficult to have access to them all. I mean, we are talking about the future here, but so ultimately it's going to happen. I think we're going to find a merger because essentially an Amazon warehouse, I don't know if you've ever seen one, it's very impressive. I mean, it's very, very tall. There's merchandise up to the ceiling. Everything is robotic, big, et cetera. So imagine your mall here in, uh, uh, that you have the Simon Mall. Imagine all the merchandise stuck together in a giant warehouse, and then everything gets delivered to you from there. I mean, that's basically what the Amazon warehouse is. And they have also the, the, the artificial intelligence to predict what you're going to want so that they store accordingly, you know, so it's kind of interesting. I have questions uh, submitted online for you. Um, so the first question is, can you address the fate of the traditional downtown? Well, I believe the traditional downtown is coming back in big time. Uh, uh, because what's going to, uh, what, what is happening is, I mean, clearly, I mean, everything I said, the CNU, you know, revitalizing downtown, people wanting mixed use environments, and there's clearly a return to downtowns. The challenge we have, if you want, how do you organize, and maybe I'm preaching for the choir here for myself, but how do you organize a main street to have a mix of tenants, which is complete and complementary. Because like, for example, I mean, I know uh, I did a project in uh, Tampa called Ybor, uh, Central Ybor. It's an Ybor city, it's a main street. There were antique dealerships, there were secondhand stores, there were, you know, the objects and so forth. And then there were some bars and restaurants. A bar and restaurant can pay more rent. So what happens is they try to push the retail away and take all the space so it becomes a bourbon street. And then from a retail standpoint, the other risk is, for example, a bookstore can pay, I mean, I'm using approximate numbers, say $20 a square foot in rent. A jewelry store can pay $75 a square foot in rent. So everybody wants the jewelry store, but there are 20 property owners. So we all want jewelry stores. So who is going to do the, the bookstore, you know, which is complementary of the rest? And so that's the challenge. So there are places like Santa Monica Third Street Promenade where they manage to have multiple owners through municipal direction to try to organize things, but there are problems there. I mean, I mean, I mean, the Californians can speak about. I mean, you know, homelessness issues. I mean, there are some issues happening which makes it difficult. But I really believe that downtowns are going to come back. And I even was saying earlier to someone today, you are going to see department stores coming back to downtown. Why? Because if I cannot coordinate 30 property owners to put the right 30 tenants a department store can organize 30 brands in one environment because they are sole masters of their building. So is the future a department store with all the merchandise in it, all the brands, everything we know, surrounded by maybe some furniture stores and then restaurants and bars and antique dealerships and so forth? Maybe that's going to be the future. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, but clearly I think the downtowns have a, have a big future. Next question is from a third year civil engineering student who wants to know if your technical experience helped you in development and also how you were able to get into the industry. Yeah. Uh, my degree is uh, from University of Toulouse. It's called, it's called Genie Civil and Urbanism. So this is a French oxymoron. So I have a civil engineering degree and I am an urbanist. They think I am. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, no, it helped. I, I, I think that I always recommend people to have two kinds of degrees, you know, black and white degrees and a gray degrees. The black and white degrees are accounting, law, engineering, and the gray degrees are architecture, you know, creativity, basically, you know, and to be able to two sides are very important. For me, engineering is, I'm very proud of it, and it has been very helpful to me. But I, I believe a, a, my son graduated from the physics department here, but here's the same, you know, black and white ability to answer questions. That's, I think, very helpful. I mean, uh, and how I get into the business, one day I decided, my wife told me, let's go and do it, and we did it. I mean, I can tell you more about that if there are more people interested and uh, if you have time, I don't know. Uh, the next question um, is, are you aware of sort of the most informative town center designs that have uh, the goal or the effect of combating global climate change? You know, that was one area we are absolutely behind. We have a problem because, I mean, you can be for or against LEED certification as a process. 
But for lead certification, it was very difficult to lead certify a shopping center because you build the building, then Victoria's Secret arrives and does the interiors. If I tell them you cannot use that material for the shelving, they will never sign a lease with me. So basically, once you sign leases, then every tenant becomes on their own. And, and they are the ones spending way more money than the building itself. So the carbon footprints of the shell doesn't give you any credit. And the carbon footprint of the interiors is always very difficult. So that has been a problem. But what we are seeing now, though, I mean, like, for example, like you are doing at Notre Dame, like in my project right now, I mean, we use about 50 megawatt hour, 50,000 megawatt hours a year. And uh, we are going to go entirely solar by 24, entirely. I mean, we have solar fields out in Ohio and we're going to purchase solar because I believe, we believe that by five, six, seven years from now, when you are trying to finance a project, there'll be two questions, an appraisal, how much is it worth before we make you a loan, and then the carbon footprint. So it's very important. So we are all trying to figure out how we are going to do this. And what's interesting is the retailers are around the gamut. I mean, local retailers, not very sophisticated. Nationals, more and more are promising, you know, more uh, uh, zero, I mean, reduced footprint designs for their interiors. I mean, and we need to increase that consciousness. I find that the interns I get from France are much more educated on this than my American interns. I mean, like, for example, when you tell them we are going to demolish a building and build something new, I mean, there's a whole carbon footprint of the demolition and of the recuperation of the materials from the demolished building and reused in the new construction. I mean, they are very aware of it. They study those things. I mean, I don't think in Ohio State University anybody studies that. More questions online, but we can take a break for anybody here who has a question. So, your distinction between need based and want based retail, uh, the dichotomy you drew, I think, is uh, very illuminating because it's, it's kind of stylized. And in your closing remarks, you, you talked about grocery stores are being a hybrid uh, as well. My question, kind of in that stylized world, is is it assuming that people's preferences or people's preferences for shopping are exogenous, that they're just given? Or is there a sense that we might think that people's preferences are endogenous in the sense that they may depend on culture, history, the built environment, real estate, and sort of yeah. where that could where that could matter is, or, or put another way, is on the need-based ones, do we want to try to make those shopping centers do we want to aspire for those to look more like the one based ones? Yeah. Or maybe the flip side is maybe we have too many one based ones because those aren't meeting basic needs or it's just discretionary. Uh, I mean, this is an interesting question, and you are touching a, <clears throat> a fragile point of my argument. In fact, the line between the two is very, very gray. There's not a clear line. And for me, the great example I, I'm in San Jose, Costa Rica, and you know, we are going somewhere to shop, and then there, the McDonald was a want-based environment. The need-based environment was the taco stand. You know, so the same product, the same exact product can be very different as a want or a need, you know, how it's perceived. So there's some grayness there. Uh, and the, the other further grayness, I mean, I want to, 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 maybe that's a, in a need environment, you buy. In a want environment, you shop for. It's diff buying and shopping are two different things, if I may say so. I mean, like, if I'm buying, I know what book I want, Amazon is perfect. I buy the book, it's done. But if I want to find a war, uh, a, a book about the Vietnam War, then going to, you know, Barnes & Noble and look at the shelves, pulling the book, looking at it, etc., is much more effective for shopping than even Amazon saying, you like that book, then you will like this. It doesn't work the same way. So, I mean, so, so, I mean, I, 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 so, so when you are trying to buy something, you are looking for efficiency. I mean, if I'm going to buy eggs, make it simple for me. I mean, I don't want to start walking half a mile between three planted alleys to get to my eggs. I mean, many grocery stores put the milk in the front, right? You get in, get your milk, walk out, because they want to make it simple. People look for efficiency. And what they are, I mean, in our way of looking at it, so I don't know if you can really mix them. Because uh, if you want the, the, the need based, what they are exploiting right now is the value of your time. Do I want, do you want to go to a grocery store, spend 45 minutes to fill your cart, go out? Or do you want empty bags that they bring to your front door and spend 40 minutes with your child 
or your husband or your wife or your loved ones. A time is valuable. So in a need based now on a want based environment, the walking down the strip, uh, checking the Louis Vuitton bags and comparing them to Michael Kors, I mean, it's part of the pleasure. It's not about buying. So from a contribution to happiness standpoint, I think it's different to separate them. Now, after the war, the Second World War, buying was a aspirational desire. They, there was so much deprivation from 1930, 1928 to 1945, that when America, we start selling malls, our parents, our grandparents, you know, dressed up with high heeled shoes and they went shopping and buying things was aspirational, was important. I mean, it was very important. The next generation after that, I mean, when you ask your kid, what do you want for birthday? I mean, they have everything, buying is not important anymore. So now everything becomes experiential. What kind of experience can you give me? I mean, I mean, I'm thinking, I do not look young people. I'm, I cannot, I'm not living this, but I can see it. You know, when you say, do you want a car? Young generation want the use of a car. Owning the car is not important, you know? And uh, so there's a change now where instead of the ownership, it's become more experiential as well. So they like the experiential, you know, I don't know if I answered exactly your question, but. I know we're in the middle of this, but what do you think about the future of theaters, movie theaters? Yeah, okay, movie theaters before COVID, they were doing about 12 billion a year uh, in ticket sales. So the question is, what will they do after COVID? Right now, they are doing about six. So that will determine what will happen. We need to see what's going to happen. So here's the, the situation. Obviously, the theater, the, the, the actors and the studios are paid by the income you know, the film receives. So more people buy things, uh, more people go to the movies or buy them at home, they make more money. During the crisis, there were some movies that were released at the same time as in the theaters. Others were not released in the theaters at all. The other way is in the theaters first and then back online later. And right now that discussion is happening, but now they are realizing that uh, the 100% online without milking it uh, in theaters is not maybe as profitable. There's even a lawsuit, the famous actress sued actually at the studio because they did not allow the theaters, the films to go to the cinema, to the theaters. Because I don't know if you know this, when a film goes to a cinema, when you go to the movies, it's just Batman. Normally, for the first week or two weeks of the film, all the proceeds of the cinema go to the studio. The theater makes no money from the film, zero. And, they, they, and then the second week, they start getting 10%, the third week, 20%, etc. etc. And then later, they get more. They make their money selling you popcorn and uh, hot dogs, and that's the way they make their money. So for a studio, if you want going directly, you know, to the customer, it's very profitable for them, you know. So we'll see how the economics work. I mean, we opened Batman. This, I mean, this last two weeks, we were at 65% of 19 uh, in volume, in theater volumes. So it's there right now. Batman was a good movie and it brought the traffic back. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. I don't, I mean, if you ask me today, would I put the cinema in a new project? I'll be nervous to put a 12 screen or 18 screen, but would I like to do one, you know, who shows movies like in the old times, you buy your ticket in the front, you get your popcorn on the left, one becomes almost an experience? Probably yes, maybe two screens, I don't know. I mean, I don't know yet. I mean, it's, it, we are in a wait and see period right now. A couple more from online. Um, by definition, you know, want-based retail investment creates sort of a luxury experience. What are your thoughts on how you might better integrate affordable housing with retail? Uh, first, uh, mixed-use environments, you know, justify how, I mean, you, you put housing in mixed-use environments, very important, and they are different prices. And I think that there has to be, I mean, it's very easy to integrate them. I mean, just in my project at Eastern right now, I mean, like 100 meter from the project, we are just building 200 units, uh, affordable. I mean, uh, under the, you know, so it can be done, but there has to be 
either the will of the developer who wants to do that, or there has to be regulations at the you know, local level who require them to do this. But affordable housing is a, is a complicated issue right now because, I mean, one of the biggest problems we have on housing is how we are building them. The way we are building houses is so antiquated today. I mean, we are building everything by hand. I mean, today, to be able to manufacture house, 30 to 35%. And we are not there yet, but I think it's starting. We are slowly waking up to that. I mean, that would be very important. I mean, I'm not answering directly question, but for me, affordable housing integration of retail is the same as integration of any kind of housing in the retail, whether they are expensive condominiums or they are rental units for young people or they are micro units or affordable housing. And, uh, and if there is a, a mandate, it can be done. If it's Notre Dame, the Catholic Church developing a project, they can require that we want that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, there's nothing, you know, particular or special, you know, about introducing those affordable housing units. One last question online. What type of partnerships and delivery models do you prefer for the design of um, your projects with your internal architects and planners versus consulting architectural firms and for construction? And do you ever trust handing off some control of any components to contractors for design build? Never design build to contractors. And 95% of the time outside architects I have lots of architects working for me, but they are my developers. They execute the projects. They don't touch. They even don't know how to do CAD. I mean, they, they still, the guys I have only draw because they graduated, I don't know how many years ago. And <laughs> so no, we, we always use outside architects and we very often be double team. That is, there are firms who are very good at creating and I like to work with them. Uh, and, and I mean, we know each other, they know what we want to do. And then very often when the design development and schematic design is complete, then sometimes for construction documents, we hire a local firm very often uh, to deal with the city and maybe construction inspections and so forth. So we go firms, local firm for the architect of record, and then for everything that's creative, uh, national firms, sometimes very often out of town. Very seldom I used an architect in the town I was building for the design. One last question about numbers. How big is Easton? Uh, how many stores at Easton? And if you do not disclose the gross sales at Easton per year, no, no, I give us an idea about what the econom that economic engine is per million square feet or something or something. What, 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 does that, what kind of importance are those kinds of- it's, Easton's retail component is 1.2 million square feet, 120,000 square meters give and take. We have about two, uh, we have about, uh, 750,000 square feet of offices. We have about 400 apartment units. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the value of the project is 1.2 billion maybe, uh, you know, and our annual sales. I always say jokingly, sales equal the value of the asset. I mean, that's not totally true always. And then we have, uh, we do close to a billion dollars in sales. And the number of stores? We have about 250 retail stores. Please ask me any question. Nobody should be timid. Good. Well, thank okay, you for your time. Well, thank you, Amir. Thanks for yeah. coming.